this remember, um, is the mic still on? Good. Okay. Uh, that was awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to be uh, having a slight uh, schedule change here. Um, uh, we had had Kamnid Singh um, listed as speaking. However, Wendell Hom is going to be speaking in his place from Callfire. Callfire is uh, one of our sponsors. Um, really, really appreciate everything that the company has been doing to help Gov20 LA. Um, they are a Santa Monica based uh, mobile company. It's really um, becoming a powerhouse. In fact, uh, one of the things that caught my eye during the 2012 elections was, you know, there were a list of polls that were running. So the, you know, the, the various media outlets had their polls, some of the polling organizations had their own polls, and then there was the Call Fire mobile poll. And um, to my knowledge, Call Fire was the only company actively doing um, full-time mobile polling in the 2012 election. Um, and obviously, I think that you know, with all of us carrying these devices, smartphones, dumb phones, tablets, whatever they are, um, mobile polling is going to become more and more critical to politicians because who answers your home phone anymore? I mean, especially during dinner time, you know, it, I know I probably never answer those calls, so I'm never counted in any of those polls. Um, however, if someone reaches me on my cell phone, you know, I probably have something to say. <laughs> Uh, and so call fire has really um, led this. I think that we're going to see a lot more of this um, mobile polling coming out of call fire and companies like it. And uh, today uh, we're going to be hearing about how you know mobility and uh, emergency services are really coming together. Um, and um, we've seen that just this week, unfortunately. Um, and fortunately, uh, you know, I think a lot of the news cycle this week was generated in part uh, out of you know, videos that people were sending to various sites and, and things that just regular citizens were doing on the street. Um, maybe they were being asked to help and they were following the lead of the Boston Police Department or, or maybe not. Or maybe they were just standing there and they happened to take a picture and then afterwards they said, oh wait, this could actually be helpful. Um, and we will have uh, two more speakers here and then we're going to have a brief lunch break and come back for more of this today. Um, if you're following on Twitter, the hashtag is GOV20LA. Feel free to ask questions. Um, are you ready? <laughs> yeah, I'm ready. All right, so Wendell Hom with Call Fire, and here you want to hold the microphone for me. Okay, good. Um, yeah, when we did those polls with the cell phone, sometimes people said, How did you get my number? <laughs> <laughs> So there are a lot of questions, and yeah. what we're ta I want to talk about is emergency services. And I want to make it clear that Coal Fire has a lot of technology, but it's putting a lot of time into training its staff to talk to the public, okay? Because when people call you in an emergency situation, they're not always calm, they're not always polite, but you have to engage them and work out the problem and not worry about what they're saying to you, okay? Because they're saying, I want it now. Why isn't it, why isn't it happening now? So uh, a lot of what we do is train our workers how to calm down the public, all right? Um, I, I like the talk so far. I mean, you know, Clint Eastwood, I was so sure he was planted by the Democrats. I mean, <laughs> it, had <to> <laughs> it had to be on purpose. And um, our neighbor's son is at JPL, and he does the curiosity thing. So that, that's also very interesting. And he talked to me about the probability of success. He said, just think about all those steps during those seven minutes. You know, what's the, probab you know, what's the probability of succeeding? And I said, it, you know, I didn't want to calculate it. And he said, they didn't want it either, but they pulled it off. That was amazing. That was really amazing. And as for 3D printers, we have one at the office, and it prints out vases, 3D vases, like <coughs> delicate uh, lace work. And it's probably printing out another one. They, they hand them out. Okay. So as we talk, a 3D printer is cranking out a vase at call fire. <laughs> so our talk here is about emergency services. And I want to talk about the technology, but I also want to talk about how we're educating our staff to engage the public, because that is a very difficult issue. And it's something that you know we can't ignore. And we think it's something that all the other companies should uh, do and tell us about what they're doing. I'm going to tell you what we do. We're not 100% sure it's working, but we're testing and testing, and uh, we want to hear what other people do, okay? Um, let's see. The thing that's interesting is that we are a cloud-based company, which means 
that if you use our services, you don't have to buy our software, you don't have to buy equipment, it's all running off our website. Okay, all that is being run in these farms and servers. So all they do is work with uh, entering what they want to do on, on, the, on, on the website. And we have to make it simple, and make it fast, and make it reliable. And so that means our people, whether the, the programmers or the people talking to the people, have to be a cross between, remember that Poindexter and the Bullwinkle show, that nerd? And then they have to be like the Renaissance man, okay? They have to be somewhere between those two extremes because they have to know the technology of the system, but they also have to know how to speak to people, and that's not easy, all right? Um, Last Monday was uh, really traumatic for us. Uh, Max is one of our energetic sales guys who pulled off uh, his crew to go um, do, a, do a presentation in Boston, which happened to coincide with the marathon. So when, on Monday, we knew Max was out there and we heard what happened, uh, it got very quiet and we got a phone call from Max. He had his cell phone on him. He's sitting on the curb. He had crossed the line, okay, and he was safe. So we were cheering. And then I got a, a, um, a text message from a friend in Boston, and he said, Nancy is okay. And I said, why shouldn't she be okay? Okay, and his point was, she's on the line, okay? She was watching it. It was Patriot's Day or something, and everybody was off in Boston that day. So the point is that we're so connected today, all right? Everything is, um, it's not as if they have to call us, go home to call us. They call us from the curbside, okay? It's, it's um, and everything seems to be happening at once and everything seems to affect all of us, all of us, all right? It's not like, oh, those people in Boston, it happens that we know all the people in Boston, right? Because we have friends in Boston. Um, Boston represents, you know, the extreme um, panic mode that we sometimes encounter. Um, Southern Wesleyan, all universities are now required to have text uh, warning systems for their students. And Southern Wesleyan represents the day-to-day -day emergency service, where they have to be ready to send out you know, if they have any situation on campus, they have to be able to touch everybody instantly. Um, they, they represent the day-to-day. -day. In the fall, we get their day-to-day -day tornado warnings because that's mostly what they get. Southern Wesleyan has a lot of tornadoes in there in the fall. Um, Chicago, yesterday, we got a funny call. It's from an elementary school teacher who was taking her class to the Brookfield Zoo. And they just had a humongous rainstorm, and it was flooding. So she called us, can you send a text message to all my parents to tell them, because she was worried about all these refugees approaching the zoo, right, to stay away from the zoo. And in a way, <coughs> we had to be able to engage the school teacher and advise her how to do it, and we did it quickly for her, okay. But that's a day-to-day -day thing that we see. It's also slightly comical. I mean, some of the things that we get for emergencies are comical, like barbecue fires out of control at a, a condo uh, party, you know, and can you tell everybody not to come to the, because we're having a fire, okay? Things like that are funny. Uh, things like Boston are not funny. Uh, things like chi Chicago are every day. And somehow you have to prepare not only your people who answer the phones to help people, but also the engineers to understand what's going on out there, okay? So, what we provide are text broadcasts. Um, my daughter got me to start using text on the cell phone, and now I find that she, she sends me text messages more than voice messages, okay? And, um, well, we still have voice broadcasts for other people, and they're, they're used by emergency uh, response teams. And uh, all those, you know, volunteer fire departments that you have out there are using the voice broadcasts. And then there are inbound calls, people we can create a virtual call center. And in this case, people 
receives calls from the outside and they handle handle the emergency situations, okay? So looking back on it, the people we serve are schools, universities, volunteer fire departments, on and on and on, okay? All kinds of organizations, all kinds of people, all kinds of backgrounds. Some are technical, some are very untechnical, okay? Some people struggle to use their computer. Um, so the services that we provide require people who can understand and communicate, right? And the result has been that people uh, tell us that it's easy to set up campaigns with us, uh, that 24-7 operations you know, are, are part of what appeals to them. Uh, the increased access, whether it's a telephone, a cell phone, or you know, a voicemail, all these things make our services more attractive to them. And they didn't happen by, by accident, okay? Um, we have a very diverse staff <coughs> and a more diverse client base. And there was a study about the MOOCs, you know, all the massive online open classrooms. Everyone's talking about them. Uh, and there was a study at MIT that pointed out that it's changing education in a profound way, but there was an important need for face-to-face -face interactions. In other words, if you just said, here's a course and it's available, you're not guaranteed that people will use it and follow it. So we insist that when our people take part in these MOOCs, and I'm supposed to be taking part in a uh, course at Duke about um, irrational behavior. Uh, it's something I studied in grad school, so I'm not really that worried about it, but um, the point is that we have these meetings on Wednesdays where we talk about it face to face. And it makes you read the, do the readings and sit in the lectures. Otherwise, we wouldn't do it, all right? Uh, we have brown bag seminars. The point is that we're trying to reach out to these online courses, but we're trying to adapt our organization so that they actually use the MOOCs. I mean, a lot of people will sign up for it and if it weren't for these face-to-face -face meetings where someone will ask you questions about it, people are not likely to really follow it, okay? Um, Alphonse Carr, I think, you know, he's the guy that said, the more things change, the more they are the same. You know, there's a lot of truth to that because the online courses are today's books. So the libraries are full of books and now they're full of these lectures online. But the fact that you have a library doesn't mean that people no longer need the university or teachers, right? If anything, they need them more. You need the person who puts that book or that course in the context of what they're doing. And that's what we do at Call Fire. We have these courses. Some of them are in programming, okay? Everybody's taking programming, database, you know, studies. And they're, they're being engaged to follow up on the course so that they just don't sign up for them, but they actually use them, okay? So we're trying to develop what's called an innovative tradition. And we define a need, we create classroom resources, whether it's a face-to-face -face lecture or online courses like the MOOCs. We, we sit down and we start evaluating the, the, the results. Are we getting better because of it? And then we'll, we're going to go on and either accept or refine these programs. But the whole point of Call Fire is that we are requiring people to take courses to understand people more so that they can communicate better. And it's not just the people who answer the phones, it's also the programmers. Okay? They're being told to make sure that the system is usable, you know, so that when you look at the screen, you don't hunt for things. They're being told to make it scalable. We do things for birthday parties. I've gotten, a guy called and says, I have a birthday party coming up. Can I use your voice broadcast? And you, know, you think it's a joke, so you help them set it up for five people. And then he mentions to me, oh yeah, I, I'm a president of a company. We've got you know, branches all over the US. Can that also be used? And it's those kind of shockers, okay, that tell you that you have to really get in the head of the person who's talking to you, whether it's for his birthday party or for his corporation, okay? and we work on both ends of the scale. And reliability is there, and uh, reliable software, open source software is there. 
So I guess I'm just uh, saying that we're talking today a lot about cloud computing, cloud services, right? But you have to emphasize that it's more, it's a lot more than the technology, okay? It's a lot more about teaching your staff to listen and have empathy. And it's also saying, telling your uh, en engineers and programmers who always say, why do you want to do it that way? That's stupid, okay? To understand that that may seem stupid to an engineer or programmer, but it's the way it's done in business, okay? So uh, we're learning from others and we're here, we're gonna learn from you, all right? Thank you. Thank you. Other questions?